Good morning everyone. Um, today actually uh, we are going to uh, discuss a topic uh, which is very very relevant in these days. Uh, uh, it's regarding the uh, antibiotics. Um, actually um, 20, uh, 18th to 24th uh, November would be the World Antibiotic Awareness Week uh, which is uh, declared by the uh, uh, World Health Organization. Uh, the theme for this uh, uh, year is preventing antimicrobial resistance together to encourage the prudent use of antimicrobials to strengthen uh, preventive measures addressing antimicrobial resistance to work together collaboratively through a One Health approach. So. Uh, we would be discussing mainly regarding the smart use of antibiotics. So uh, today uh, the overview uh, of my lecture would be I'm going to talk about um, definition of the antibiotics, uh, mechanism of resistance to antibiotics, the severity of this problem and the need to overcome and uh, regarding the mechanism of action that is the pharm pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics of the antibiotics and uh, the most important part of the lecture would be how to use rationally. So when we talk about infection infections had been a major cause of death before 20th century uh, you can see these pictures and you can see the gravity of the problem uh, it had been a um, uh, severe uh, morbidity, uh, one of the major causes of morbidity and mortality on these days and uh, actually uh, the discovery of penicillin uh, had been the beginning of the golden era of antibiotics. This um, uh, significant uh, uh, discovery of penicillin had been one of the uh, major medical achievement of the 20th century. Uh, this was a very interesting story also. Uh, it was discovered by Sir Alexander Fleming in 1928. He uh, saw, uh, uh, he had this, had this uh, discarded uh, uh, culture plate of Staph Staphylococcus aureus and he noticed uh, on the next day uh, that there had been a uh, fungi which has grown in the plate and this was a penicillium uh, fungi and there had been a zone of inhibition around the fungi for the uh, uh, for this um, Staph aureus growth and he was thinking about this and he thought there should be a substance which was produced by the penicillium uh, uh, the penicillium um, uh, fungi uh, to cause the inhibition of the growth. So with this uh, discovery of uh, penicillin uh, the uh, I, as I said it was a golden era of antibiotics and there had been several classes of antibiotics which was produced from uh, 1930s up to 1990s actually uh, even though the penicillin was the first uh, discovered uh, antibiotic the sulfonamides came to the market uh, before penicillins and it uh, took about uh, 10 years for the people to develop penicillin as a usable drug and uh, all the antibiotic classes uh, now we are actually um, uh, you be using in our hospitals have been uh, discovered uh, before 1970. So um, and uh, together with this uh, uh, discovery of new antibiotic classes, we, they also noticed uh, that there are uh, resistance among these antibiotics for the several bacteria. And um, uh, in uh, actually, uh, Sir Alexander Fleming, with two other people, uh, won the Nobel Prize uh, in 1945 for the discovery of penicillin. And in his um, uh, acceptance speech, he was uh, talking about the resistance to penicillin. So even in 1945, they knew that uh, the bacteria is developing resistant to antibiotics. So most of the inventions in modern medicine became realistic because of the antibiotics. Major surgeries, uh, transplant, uh, sorry, uh, the prosthetic uh, uh, surgeries, uh, chemotherapy as well as transplant uh, surgeries had been become realistic because of the antibiotics as they were there to uh, combat uh, 
uh, the uh, complications of uh, infections. So, if we talk about antibiotics, what are antibiotics? So, antibiotics uh, are uh, medicines which can kill or inhibit the growth of bacteria. So, it is only useful to treat or prevent bacterial infections. So, okay. right. So, um, antibiotic types, there are several antibiotic types uh, which are uh, being in the use of, uh, in, the, uh, in our healthcare institutions. Uh, there are cell wall inhibitors, uh, protein synthesis inhibitors, inhibit, um, uh, some inhibit the uh, 30th subunit of the ribosome or some in, in, inhibit the 50th uh, subunit of the ribosomes, DNA synthesis inhibitors, there are a lot of uh, antibiotic types. Uh, and um, these ones are actually, uh, these are categorized by the mechanism of action. As you can clearly see, uh, there are uh, antibiotics which uh, inhibit the cell wall synthesis. Those are penicillins, cephalosporins, beta lactamine inhibitors, vancomycin, carbapenems, all those are cell wall synthesis. Uh, they inhibit the cell wall synthesis. And um, there are protein synthesis inhibitors also. Uh, for an example, uh, aminoglycosides like gentamicin, um, amikacin, uh, tetracyclines, they all inhibit the 30th subunit of the uh, ribosome and thereby they inhibit the protein synthesis. And uh, also macrolides, uh, clindamycins and chloramphenicol, those are inhibitors of 50th subunit. So all these uh, inhibit the protein synthesis ultimately and there are uh, DNA synthesis inhibitors like uh, fluoroquinolones like ciprofloxacin and metronidazole. So, um, and uh, the other type uh, or the uh, other classification of antibiotic would be there are bacteriostatic antibiotics and bacteriocidal antibiotics. So when you talk about the bacteriostatic that means they can't really kill the bacteria but they will uh, inhibit the growth of bacteria. For example, of bacteriostatic antibiotics would be chloramphenicol, erythromycin, clindamycin, uh, trimethoprims or co-trimexosols, uh, tetracyclines. Uh, whereas there are bactericidal antibiotics also. They can kill the bacteria. They uh, do not uh, uh, they are mainly, they are the ones which are more important uh, in sometimes managing serious infections because they can kill the bacteria. For example, uh, aminoglycosides, beta-lactam drugs uh, like uh, penicillins, cephalosporins, uh, vancomycin, uh, quinolones, rifampicin and metronidazole, all of them are bactericidal. And the third category would be broad spectrum antibiotics versus narrow spectrum antibiotics. So there are depending on the spectrum, what is the spectrum of the antibiotic? It is like they act on certain bacteria. For an example, some antibiotics only be effective on gram positive bacteria only. Some have action against gram positive as well as gram negative bacteria and some of the uh, bacteria some of the antibiotics are capable of killing all the bacteria types like gram positive bacteria gram negative anaerobic all would be killed by this one so when we talk about the broad spectrum antibiotics they active they are active on large number of bacteria species and they are mainly used when we need to treat a infection empirically. That means we don't have a positive culture, patient comes with sepsis and the patient is, needs emergency antibiotic uh, uh, requirement is there. So we need to think about all the possible um, bacteria which can cause the uh, illness and we need to use one of the broader spectrum antibiotics. For, for example, uh, broader spectrum antibiotics would be carbapenems like meropenem and imipenem and chloramphenicol and second, uh, third, fourth generation cephalosporins like uh, cefiroxime, uh, cephalospor, uh, sorry, um, uh, cephraxone or cephotaxime or cefixime. Uh, 
third generation quinolones like ciprofloxacin uh, or maybe even uh, uh, the ones uh, better than uh, ciprofloxacin would be moxifloxacin all those are broad spectrum antibiotics whereas narrow spectrum coverage is there they are active in only uh, on few number of bacteria species we use the narrow spectrum antibiotics for targeted treatment of documented infections that means we have a positive culture we know what the pathogen is and there is a antibiogram available on that uh, isolate so we can select one of the narrow spectrum ones like penicillin is a narrow spectrum antibiotic clindamycin is a narrow spectrum antibiotics maybe vancomycin ticoplanin would be narrow spectrum antibiotics uh, rifampicin daptomycin all of them are only useful in treating gram positive focites or gram positive organisms so we are talking about antibiotics so much why are we worried about antibiotic use that is because even though we have um, uh, we have managed to combat um, uh, the bacterial illnesses there is a uh, worrying factor antibiotic resistance so why uh, it has been as I said earlier, uh, Fleming himself warned of the danger of antibiotic uh, resistance in his uh, Nobel Prize lecture. So it is not a new thing. Uh, since the beginning of the antibiotic era, the antibiotic resistance has been a major issue. So what is this antibiotic resistance? Microorganisms like bacteria, fungi, viruses and parasites can change their uh, structure or maybe sometimes their uh, action uh, when they are exposed to antimicrobial drugs. So microorganisms will not be inhibited by the usual achievable systemic concentration of the antimicrobial agent with the normal dosing schedule. So when we give uh, uh, antibiotic uh, in normal dosage uh, we are expecting them to have a systemic concentration of uh, 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 um, uh, adequate levels uh, they are they maintain adequate level of uh, antibiotics in their body but the uh, microorganism will not be killed so uh, because of this resistance medicine will become ineffective and the infections can persist so uh, how does this antibiotic resistant will develop and spread so there are several mechanisms of antibiotic resistance actually uh, uh, some uh, uh, bacteria uh, give rise to uh, certain enzymes which can inactivate the drug and some of the bacteria can uh, change their uh, structure which the, the, the uh, antibiotic needs to come and uh, bind uh, the organism to uh, get into the uh, cell so uh, the alteration of the drug target will be uh, will happen and uh, drug will no longer uh, will be not um, act, uh, the uptake uh, the uptake would be inhibited and um, some of the uh, in some of the uh, bacteria there would be efflux pumps so uh, actively uh, they can pump out the uh, antibiotic even if the antibiotic will get into the bacteria cell so uh, but uh, how does this uh, antibiotic resistance happens usually when we have um, antibiotic uh, antibiotic will uh, act on normal bacteria and in normal bacteria uh, they get killed by the adequate concentration of the antibiotic but there could be when when we all know bacteria will be divided uh, by binary fission and it is a very fast process and within one minute there would be million copies of bacteria uh, which will be produced and because of this uh, process there would be some mutations happen in genetic material of the bacteria these are we call mutations and some of these mutations have the uh, ability to resist the antibiotics so uh, 
when we give an antibiotic to somebody um, uh, the normal bacteria which doesn't have the uh, mutant gene will be killed by the uh, antibiotic concentration but mutant uh, bacteria will remain and this bacteria can multiply and give rise to offspring which has the resistant gene so ultimately the normal flora of our body will be replaced by the uh, resistant uh, bacteria so uh, we all know that we have a microbiome uh, that is there is a normal bacterial flora in our body especially in the skin and our gi system we have normal flora and when we use frequent antibiotics or maybe broad spectrum antibiotics all of these uh, uh, the useful bacteria normal bacteria or our microbiome will be changed into resistant microbi microbiome uh, which contains resistant bacteria so when we have a person who has resistant bacteria it can spread in the whole society how does it happen when uh, we can see uh, in this diagram there is a person called george and he has developed resistant bacteria in his gut uh, because of co constant use of or irrational use of antibiotics and when the patient get admitted uh, to a healthcare institution this person can contaminate the environment surrounding environment of this patient uh, and because of the uh, the resistant bacteria can uh, contaminate the healthcare facility other patients are also get uh, the resistant bacteria because of various infection control practices uh, breaching so uh, this resistant bacteria will be spread to healthcare workers or health, uh, other caregivers of the patients or maybe to other patients and uh, these healthcare maybe it's healthcare uh, workers or maybe other patients when they go home uh, they also spread the uh, antibiotic resistant bacteria to their close ones because most of the time our skin get uh, shelling of the skin will be there uh, every day so with the skin scales and uh, when we uh, with our feces it can contaminate the whole household and therefore our uh, close uh, family members will be uh, colonized with resistant bacteria also and also the the, the major problem of resistance uh, where how it uh, spread in the society would be uh, uh, another thing which we don't realize actually uh, because an animal farming animal farming because animals they get uh, antibiotics very regularly as growth promoters and because this uh, actually uh, the WHO says out of the 41 antibiotic classes almost 31 classes classes of antibiotics will be uh, used in the um, uh, they, are, they are being used uh, in animal farming so animals are uh, most of the time they uh, are colonized with resistant bacteria in their guts so when we use the meat of these uh, animals these if the if we use uncooked or not properly cooked uh, uh, animal uh, parts or animal meat uh, we end up having the resistant bacteria because they remain in these uh, meat products and uh, we also use the animal uh, uh, feces as fertilizers uh, so they can uh, contaminate the food crops also and uh, it also uh, contaminate the water so when we use these contaminated water or maybe contaminated food crops we also get the uh, resistant bacteria that is how the uh, resistant um, resistance spread in the society
So the magnitude of the global and local problem of antibiotic resistance. As I said earlier, uh, the pharmacological companies uh, had been in a frenzy to develop several antibiotic classes until 1980s. But after that, actually from 1970 or maybe 80, from 2000, up to 2000, there had been an innovation gap for the antibiotics because the, most of the companies thought, okay, now it is enough to produce antibiotics because it is no longer a profitable uh, uh, field they wanted to invest their money into more lucrative products like antihypertensives and anti-diabetic drugs so uh, now actually there is a uh, dry uh, pipeline of antibiotic production because most of the time we only have the antibiotics which had been already produced now very few antibiotics are under development so we have resistance as a very uh, problematic uh, thing in the world and we have very few novel new or new antibiotics under the development so Whatever the uh, antibiotics we have are uh, very important because we need to keep them for uh, keep them to tackle uh, antibiotic resistance. So when we talk about the antibiotic resistance, the mo the most problematic thing would be the uh, having superbugs. What are these? Superbugs. Superbugs are bacteria that can survive exposure to antibiotics, which uh, we have currently actually they carry the resistant genes and these genes uh, can be passed between the bacteria also so when a bacteria carries several genes uh, several resistant genes uh, for antibiotics these are called superbugs so these bacteria will be resistant to many classes of antibiotics like for an example beta lactam uh, cephalosporins or maybe aminoglycosides all of them are uh, resistant uh, with the uh, superbugs and these infections uh, the infections caused by these superbugs will be very very hard to treat so uh, for the Examples for these superbugs are, you all know, Acinetobacter, which we um, isolate from most of the ICUs, are multidrug resistant. Uh, we are very familiar with the uh, MRSA or methicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus. Uh, there are Burkholderia carpatia, which are multidrug resistant. E. coli, you all have must have heard about New Delhi metalabetolactamase uh, reducing E. coli, which was uh, first identified in India and uh, it's a very common problem in Indian uh, continent uh, and uh, TB is very known to have uh, extreme drug uh, resistant uh, antibiotic resistance and um, even Klebsiella and um, WHO is really worried about the AMR rightfully so because they have predicted if we don't tackle uh, antibiotic resistance in at the moment we will be end up having uh, severe um, uh, mortality rates uh, with uh, antibiotic resistance it is like they have predicted uh, 10 million in 2050 due to AM, uh, the infections due to resistant genes whereas uh, the cancer cholera and even diabetics they have less number of uh, deaths uh, compared to uh, resistance uh, resistant infections so again another uh, 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 the map uh, shows uh, more clearly the deaths attributable to antimicrobial resistant uh, by uh, 2050 as you can see asia is the highest uh, carries the highest number of deaths, predictable deaths in 2050 uh, due to the AMR. So uh, when we talk about Asian region, uh, some of the Asian countries have uh, 
shown the highest prevalence of MRSA and Sri Lanka is one of them uh, and uh, this has been taken this map has been taken from uh, infected uh, chemotherapy uh, in 2013 and this is actually the national surveillance data which was published in uh, 2014 by the Sri Lanka College of Microbiologists and it shows very alarming uh, data and it shows the antibiotic sensitivity of the coliform organisms uh, it uh, the 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 numbers or the percentages for uh, of sensitivity for ciprofloxacin uh, coamoxiclav those are the uh, the the commonly used antibiotics for uh, coliforms these carries a very low level of sensitivity and these figures are much worse uh, in the current current context so uh, these are all published data uh, regarding the uh, several uh, hospitals also this is uh, the data from uh, Javadanpura general hospital and it also shows the similar uh, uh, rates to what I have been discussing in the earlier slide. So what can we do about it? We only can do um, uh, is using antibiotics rationally. So the definition of the rational use of antibiotics would be uh, to prescribe uh, antibiotics uh, for the patients uh, uh, according, according to the clinical need in doses that meet the, need their own individual requirement for an adequate period of time at the lowest cost. So this is a very complicated definition. So in other words, uh, antibiotics should be used uh, for appropriate patient, appropriate indication, appropriate drug considering efficacy. A safety suitability for the patient and the cost and appropriate administration should be uh, practiced dosage route and duration uh, need to be taken care of appropriate combinations of drugs should be given and the patient adherence to treatment is also very important so what is rational antibiotic therapy uh, so why is it needed because we, we need to give a better care for the patients as you can see antibiotic resistance is a problem one day in the near future we have to tell the patients okay you have an infection and you carry a very resistant uh, antibiotic uh, resistant bacteria and uh, the current antibiotics that we have will no longer uh, be helped to you so uh, you might have to die from this infection that is what we might have to say in the future if we don't use the antibiotics rationally so uh, we actually uh, by using ration, antibiotic uh, antibiotics rationally we can combat the antibiotic uh, resistance and uh, we can reduce the cost of treatment also because we all know all the antibiotics the high fi antibiotics the broad spectrum antibiotics are very very costly and it takes a massive chunk out of our healthcare budget so to use antibiotics rationally we have four general principles uh, we need to always practice the first thing is we always have to question whether the antibiotic is necessary for this patient so when we talk about the um, necessity of antibiotics we as i said earlier antibiotics are only for bacterial infection and not all the fevers are due to infections fever is a symptom that is that may be due to infections or may be due to some other reason so uh, we should not be panicked with the fever always because and the magnitude of the fever will not reflect the severity of the infection also not all infections are due to bacteria again majority of the infections we can see are due to viruses for an example dengue covid even uh, uh, normal uh, 
what we call the cold is due to influenza viruses most of the infections that we encounter day in day to day life would be due to viruses as the name suggests again antibiotics will not be effective against viruses so whatever we see uh, we need to think whether it it could be due to uh, viruses or it could be due to antibiotics sorry uh, bacteria before prescribing antibiotics and the second thing is we might think then we sometimes uh, uh, see patients and we think okay we need to give antibiotic to prevent secondary bacterial infections this is not at all a correct practice and it is not useful to treat uh, or uh, to give any antibiotic to prevent secondary bacterial infections because it is a very rare occurring even in bacterial infections antibiotic might not be required for an example small abscesses will need only ind superficial skin infections will not need antibiotics they only need uh, careful uh, dressing uh, re regular dressings wound dressings so the first basic uh, principle uh, is the antibiotic is necessary we need to always think about and the second uh, general uh, principle would be what is the most appropriate antibiotic so we have decided that the patient is patient needs antibiotics and the uh, the second question that we need to ask okay if the patient needs antibiotics uh, what would be the most appropriate antibiotic so the choice of antibiotic will depend on three factors one would be etiological agent or the pathogen that would be causing the infection the patient factors and the drug factors this is really really important because etiological agent etiological agent that would depend on the clinical diagnosis again clinical acumen when the patient comes to you you need to first think about where the sepsis is for an example patient can come with a cellulitis and uh, that would be the most likely site or the source of infection so when you have a patient with cellulitis you need to think about the most likely pathogen we all know um, in cellulitis the most likely pathogens would be staphylococcus aureus or some certain streptococcus like group a streptococcus so our clinical diagnosis is the patient is having a sepsis due to cellulitis and we actually we don't have a culture in the beginning so we need to think about a empirical treatment empirical means you don't you guess what the diagnosis is and you guess what would be the causative pathogens and you would be selecting an antibiotic for that because actually uh, in sepsis we always say that treating early would reduce the morbidity and mortality so depend the the empirical therapy or the choice of antibiotic which you choose to give earlier will be depending on universal data on resistance or local data on resistance we all know that now this is a very very difficult thing for most of you because most of the um, doctors are sometimes are um, uh, not really confident regarding the microbiology knowledge so um, the and also the resistant patterns or the lo local antibiotic resistant data will vary from country to country uh, for an example uh, in Sri Lanka the resistant patterns will be quite different from uh, USA or maybe Australia compared to uh, developed countries developing countries have more resistant bacteria because of the misuse of the antibiotics because uh, in developing developed countries they 
are more stringent towards antibiotic use and they have antibiotics the well established well uh, practiced uh, antibiotic stewardship programs in their healthcare institutions so there is a clear uh, uh, difference between the resistant pattern uh, in these uh, countries and also from the hospital to hospital in the same country for an example the Kuliapitiya uh, teaching hospital uh, the resistant pattern of in our hospital will be quite different to uh, the resistance pattern in national hospital of Sri Lanka uh, so, in even from unit to unit in the same hospital, there are differences. Uh, the medical uh, unit, uh, the resistant pattern of the medical unit uh, uh, will be uh, quite different from the resistant patterns of uh, genomes unit. So, we need to always have a clear idea about these resistant patterns. So, it is a uh, bit difficult task for the prescriber because if it is not properly documented or uh, if the resistance patterns are not readily available, it would be really difficult for the uh, prescribers to choose an antibiotic which is appropriate. And uh, uh, the these are actually these are uh, not uh, really uh, these are not um, uh, not a law actually these are kind of a trend on, only so we they are only they are to guide the empirical treatment uh, so that is why uh, the Sri Lanka College of Microbiologists have published the empirical and prophylactic use of antimicrobial national guidelines which was published in uh, 2016 and uh, this a copy of this uh, guidelines ha is available in the website and it is also av available physically in each unit so this is what you can use to choose an antibiotic if you want to so uh, the second thing is um, uh, the, we, I was talking about the clinical diagnosis and you need to have a lab diagnosis also this will be done by performing cultures so uh, we can do uh, gram staining we can do antigen detection for certain uh, uh, illnesses and we can do culture and ABSD so all these are uh, only lab reports interpretation of the report also very very important because lab uh, microbiology reports uh, it's really difficult to um, differentiate a pathogen from normal colonizing flora because as I said there are colonizing flora in our body uh, which can uh, be uh, contaminated in the uh, sample that we would be uh, processing. So it is really important to give clear cut in instruction to the uh, collector of the uh, sample and uh, need to uh, maintain proper uh, storage and transport uh, to the uh, laboratory to uh, have a very good culture report and what isolated will not be necessarily the path pathogen so sensitivity reports therefore could be a guide only you need to always think of the clinical background before start treating the patient because we don't want to treat a colonizing flora or contaminating flora because uh, antibiotic at that uh, instance might not be necessary and um, uh, etiological agent and I uh, told you that patient factors are also important in selecting uh, antibiotic and these patient factors would be age age definitely because neonates and extreme old age uh, there would be uh, differences in gastric acidity and uh, some drugs will uh, affect the bone formation so we'll, we will always try to avoid those type of antibiotics in uh, uh, younger children and uh, definitely the age would be a uh, 
deciding factor in choosing antibiotics and physiological functions renal functions hepatic functions are really important because we need to adjust the doses according to the renal function or hepatic function because most of the antibiotics will be either ex metabolized and excreted uh, by liver or uh, by uh, renal system. So genetic factors again you know about G6PD deficiency. Uh, the patients who have G6PD deficiency will not be able to uh, receive certain antibiotics. For an example, co-trimexazole will be definitely uh, need to be avoided in these patients. Uh, so we need to uh, look into the um, uh, look into genetic factors in the history before prescribing. And pregnancy again, uh, because of the teratogenicity of certain drugs or maybe the lack, uh, lack of availability of certain studies, we sometimes try to uh, avoid certain drugs in pregnancy. Sight and the severity in, of infection is really important because we need to always to treat an infection, we need to achieve adequate concentrations in the blood. The drug levels should reach the adequate concentrations. So uh, if we are unable to, uh, if a certain drug is unable to reach the adequate concentration, uh, we should not use that particular drug. For an example again, um, in meningitis, if the patient, uh, if the drug cannot penetrate the blood brain barrier, we should not use that particular drug. Penetration into fibrin clots is again important. Why? Because uh, in uh, infective endocarditis, we actually need to um, uh, give a drug which can penetrate the fibrin clots because bacteria will be entrapped in this fibrin clot. So uh, that is really important. The presence of foreign bodies, biofilms have is the one of the major problems in prosthetic devices and also in foreign uh, bodies uh, because bacteria are well known to uh, form biofilms in these prosthetic devices. So, uh, ab in ability to uh, treat the infection successfully, the drug has to have the uh, the capability of destroying these biofilms. And again, the last but not least, uh, allergy is really important. Even though the drug is very good and it is a broad spectrum if the patient is allergic we can't use that drug so the third factor on choosing antibiotic appropriate antibiotic would be the antibiotic factors there are pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamic profile of the drug toxicity is really important drug to drug interactions can be there cost is very important. So when we talk about the pharmacodynamics and pharmacokinetics, PK or pharmacokinetics is the action of the body on the administrator and, and administered drug uh, that is absorption, distribution, metabolism and excretion uh, to define the systemic exposure because uh, 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 the, the certain drug level is very important in treating the infection because if you have sub-therapeutic uh, concentration levels, uh, you might no, not be able to achieve what we want. PDA or pharmacodynamics is the biochemical or physiologic response of the drug uh, and its mechanism of uh, action. So PKPD analysis is really important to uh, uh, define the optimal antibiotic dosing regimens for the efficacy as well as for prevention of resistance. So uh, as I said earlier pharmacokinetics include absorption, distribution, uh, metabolism and elimination. When we talk about the distribution uh, you all know certain drugs have a high volume of distribution and certain drugs have low volume of uh, drug distribution that is the tissue uh, concentration if the uh, if we need a uh, high tissue concentration you need to have a, a drug with a uh, high volume of distribution and uh, 
if we give a drug uh, to the patient and the metabolism if the drug is uh, quickly metabolized and eliminated in the body we need to have uh, uh, frequent dosing maybe or um, uh, we need to think of something else uh, because it might not be the best suitable drug for the infection and regarding the pharmacodynamics uh, there are main three categories actually in uh, pharmacodynamics reg reg regarding the antibiotics that is concentration dependent killing um, and uh, that is uh, divided into two things peak uh, concentration into MIC or 24 hour uh, AUC area under the curve into MIC and uh, time dependent drug killing. Uh, these are really um, pharmaco uh, pharmacology uh, theoretical part. I don't think that you need to uh, go through this as much but most important thing would be uh, when you have a concentration dependent uh, drugs uh, killing uh, uh, which like uh, and aminoglycosides or fluoroquinolones you need to maximize the concentrations so you always have to increase the concentration that is why we always say once daily dosing of gentamicin is better than three times daily dosing of uh, gentamicin so you need to maximize the concentration to achieve the uh, desired level of uh, action and regarding the time dependent killing those uh, antibiotics would be uh, your cephalosporins, penicillins, carbapenems all those uh, have the time dependent killing these for these actually you need to maximize the duration of exposure you can do uh, this by uh, reducing the frequency like uh, you can give it uh, uh, very in very frequent uh, episodes or you can um, uh, give the drug uh, in not as a uh, bolus you can give as a uh, infusion okay so uh, for an example, I don't know, uh, some, sometimes uh, uh, we come and say meropenem should be given as two hourly infusions. That is because it is a time dependent uh, uh, drug. So we need to give a more uh, persistent duration of exposure to get the maximum out of it. So, um, uh, that is what you have to uh, kind of uh, keep in mind uh, regarding these uh, PKPD ones um, and uh, uh, the third one uh, so uh, we have um, talked about whether the patient needs antibiotic and if it is needed uh, what would be the appropriate drug or, or how to choose a uh, antibiotic we have discussed so as uh, the third general principle of uh, rational use of antibiotic would be to uh, decide upon a dose frequency root and duration dose actually we need to give the optimal doses because most of the time we see a very very wrong practice you you might not be uh, sure about the doses maybe or maybe uh, you are not uh, really um, uh, familiar with adjusting the doses according to the drug levels or maybe uh, with the renal uh, doses you are uh, using uh, suboptimal doses these suboptimal user doses will uh, enhance the uh, resistance because it when in the suboptimal doses uh, bacteria can develop the resistant genes very easily so doses need to be adjusted according to the weight uh, if the patient is overweight you need to you can't use the normal way uh, the doses you need to increase and depending on the severity of infection sometimes we consider uh, dose adjustment and of course you all know in the renal function um, uh, uh, derangement we adjust the doses.
and the choice of regimen whether the patient needs oral or parenteral is a very very debatable thing traditionally we thought if the serious infection means you need iv but that was before uh, uh, the availability of broad, spe broad spectrum oral antibiotics so if the pay the the antibiotic has a reliable bioavailability uh, we can use oral so uh, there are really improved oral agents uh, which can achieve higher or more, more persistent serum levels or tissue levels so uh, it would be uh, good as parental for certain infections the best uh, example that i can give would be uh, ciprofloxacin or linazolid both have oral options and both of the them have a very good bioavailability so they are very good uh, for certain infections to uh, treat as a oral option when we talk about um, when we talk about the IV actually we consider IV when the patient cannot um, uh, withstand oral antibiotics or maybe sometimes with severe vomiting or unconscious patient we choose IV option uh, as the uh, better option and sometimes um, uh, when the when we treating very serious infections like meningitis we never opt for uh, oral antibiotics we always go for uh, IV antibiotics uh, but as soon as uh, the uh, uh, the uh, patient can uh, tolerate oral if the uh, uh, IV drugs are not indicated you can switch to oral so uh, the third thing would be okay so the third thing would be uh, duration of antibiotics uh, that, that is again a very um, uh, mostly um, uh, unsure aspect of antibiotic therapy because um, the duration actually uh, will more in most instance, instances optimal duration is not really known. So uh, sometimes in uh, infections uh, there is a minimum duration of antibiotics is recommended for an example uh, in infective endocarditis we all know it is four weeks to six weeks of antibiotics in uh, TB infections there are uh, duration well defined durations are there uh, to treat TB infections and uh, sometimes in, in uh, the in meningitis also we have a minimum duration of antibiotics which are which have been predetermined but the thing is for the most uh, infections that we encounter in day-to-day -day life do not have an optimum duration which was well recognized from the beginning the what I feel is shorter duration higher doses would be the best so duration varies from single dose to several months as you all know uh, in certain UTIs uh, single dose might be very well adequate but uh, for certain infections you need to give in long duration depending on the clinical response of the patient so uh, when you uh, treat a normal infection or maybe mild to moderate infection uh, you always have to keep an optimum duration of maybe five to seven days not after that because most of the time uh, when you use a drug for five days or seven days that that is the the patient will give a beneficial response if the patient is responding so that has to be kept in your mind regarding uh, treating and monitoring the patient during the treatment and uh, the the final thing regarding the uh, dose and frequency and the uh, uh, administration you need to think about the combination of antibiotics with another uh, 
antibiotics. So uh, initially we tend to kind of uh, combine the antibi two antibiotics together to get a broader spectrum of co cover and I was talking about the spectrum earlier and when we want to have a broad spectrum cover we uh, initially uh, combine these drugs together and also when we want to treat polymicrobial infections we combine antibiotics all together. Sometimes in for an example in TB we use combinations in prevention of emergence of resistance also. So to prevent resistance we combine drugs as you all know in TB we use four drugs main the, the main use of four drugs would be to reduce the emergence of resistant to resistant bacteria. When we combine drugs we actually want to have a synergy because when you uh, use two antibiotics together uh, for an example in uh, infective endocarditis we combine penicillin uh, and gentamicin together because gentamicin would uh, have a good positive action against penicillin. Uh, in pseudomonas infections, you have beta lactam uh, uh, antibiotic uh, combined gentamicin. So, you have a uh, positive action with both the antibiotics. The problem is you when you combine if you don't know the spectrum or the action of the antibiotic you give wrong combination these strong combination give rise to antagonism of the antibiotic it might not be uh, the best action that a single uh, antibiotic would give it can antagonize with the each other cost would be unnecessarily high and when you use two drugs adverse effects also be there from not only one but from two antibiotics so uh, the final uh, thing final basic uh, uh, the uh, principle of uh, rational use of antibiotics would be to uh, see always see whether the treatment is effective so monitoring the efficacy of the antibiotics so we need to always early review of the response uh, depending on the clinical response of the patient or maybe depending on the uh, lab uh, investigations for, for an example uh, the uh, response of the CRP whether it is reducing or increasing together with the WBC counts you can have a basic idea of the uh, clinical response for for the antibiotic so depending on the response you can always ask usually the the, the actually um, the most common uh, uh, the uh, the response from the clinicians uh, would be when we start an antibiotic after two doses maybe three doses uh, we will be asked okay uh, the patient has not responded even after starting an antibiotic may the, may be the maybe the fever would be still there and uh, sometimes the crp might not be uh, uh, really decreased so uh, they will be asking whether we need to change an antibiotics even after two uh, or three doses so when we need to always remember is it needs at least a 48 hours to have a good response so uh, depending on the uh, uh, the start of antibiotics uh, after 48 hours you can see whether the, the fever is reducing or the height of fever spikes would be reducing and crp would be responding together with full blood count and uh, if the patient is clinically better if the patient uh, has reduced their symptoms of infections so 
that means the patient is responding uh, depending on the response you can increase or decrease the level of treatment you can change the route if the patient is responding to IV treatment if the patient can tolerate the antibiotic orally in certain uh, infections you can change it to oral uh, like skin infections maybe or maybe uh, other but uh, the the infections like meningitis you need to keep the IV route and you can change the doses depending on the uh, renal uh, functions or maybe sometimes you start with higher doses and depending on the serum creatinine levels you need to adjust the doses again uh, and sometimes we do the drug levels of uh, certain drugs for an example gentamicin or vancomycin depending on the drug levels you have to adjust the doses and you can if the patient is not responding you need to think about increasing the spectrum that is of course if you still think the patient is having a uh, infection uh, you need to increase the spectrum of the antibiotics and sometimes if the patient is having a positive uh, you start an broad spectrum antibiotic and you send a culture and after three days you would be having a positive culture report that shows the antibiogram of that uh, isolate so uh, you can select a more narrow spectrum antibiotic and change the uh, antibiotic into more na narrower targeted uh, antibiotic uh, uh, can be started and um, lastly after two three days you will realize the infection uh, the fever is not due to or the patient's condition might not be due to infection it could be due to connective tissue disorder or any other uh, disorder which can also can mimic uh, infections so you can stop the antibiotics that is where we always uh, are not really confident in stopping and antibiotics when not necessary uh, because we always think okay we can keep the antibiotic just in case so th there is no just in case in using antibiotics uh, you need to always uh, have the confidence on uh, in stopping antibiotics when it is not needed and uh, there are several reasons for non-response to antibiotics it could be due to resistance uh, could be due to wrong diagnosis suboptimal doses might be their route might be uh, have to be changed uh, maybe the antibiotic will not be able to reach the site of infection and when there is a pus collection no matter uh, you give antibiotics uh, it will not penetrate the pus so uh, the maximum killing of the bacteria will not be there and there could be secondary infection due to from some other bacteria and lastly you need to think about the drug fever also so we always actually kind of tend to over treat patients uh, most of the time uh, we have good intentions of sending the patient home early uh, and uh, we might not be uh, very uh, confident in dosing so inappropriate dosing might be uh, used and inappropriate prophylaxis will be used uh, and uh, use of multiple antibiotics broad spectrum combination to cover, cover the possibilities there that is one of the uh, very bad practices that we always see most of the time in uh, cellulitis you try to combine augmentin together with toxicity but unfortunately these ones this is a very bad combination because uh, the coemoseclave has the uh, ability of tackling uh, staph aureus as well as uh, uh, streptococci uh, you don't have to add cloxacillin on top of coemoseclave pressure from the patients are another reason to give inappropriate uh, antibiotics because patients insist on having antibiotics even for certain viral infections time concerns constraints are there cost and the availability nowadays actually the most the 
common problem would be the availability of the uh, antibiotics and most of the time other diagnostic facilities like lab investigations. So uh, sometimes we fear of litigations. Uh, so we kind of try to over treat of patients. Uh, and uh, sometimes uh, we inappropriately use antibiotics to prevent the prevalence of resistance, thinking about the resistance, but unfortunately, uh, unknowingly, uh, we uh, contribute to the resistance again and uh, we actually have a huge pressure from the pharmaceutical manufacturers also uh, to use certain antibiotics. So we need to streamline our antibiotic use in the hospital. So for that, we need to have antibiotic stewardship. Uh, this, uh, this is uh, uh, coordinated interventions, which is uh, designed to improve the measure, uh, improve and measure appropriate uh, use of antimicrobials uh, in the uh, hospitals, uh, using the optimal uh, drug regimens use those optimal doses in duration uh, optimal duration and route of administration i'm not going to talk about antibiotic stewardship today because it is a se well separate uh, thing uh, but uh, there are very major six elements uh, essential elements which includes active strategies supplementary strategies information technology microbiology lab and uh, monitoring process should be there uh, so this is a very multi uh, disciplinary uh, team approach should be there to achieve effective antimicrobial stewardship so uh, i'm not going to talk about uh, that but uh, lastly i would talk about uh, red light antimicrobials i don't know whether you are aware of that but uh, in sri lanka also we have red light antimicrobials where you need the authorization of the consultant microbiologist of the hospital prior to prescribing these antibiotics uh, these red light antibiotics are astronam kefixime colistine then uh, daptomycin fusidic acid dinosolid moxifloxacin levofloxacin Rifampicin, tetracycline, anulafungine, liposomal lampotacin B, posaconazole, voriconazole, and kefaparazone salvactam. So you individually can think about this and um, see and think whether you are uh, aware. I don't know whether you are aware of these uh, red light antimicrobials, and you need to think about uh, whether you. Uh, take uh, consultant microbiology uh, 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 approval before using. I don't think I never get, uh, have um, uh, uh, consultations uh, before starting levofloxacin or moxi or maybe fusidic acid that is the real truth uh, even though the circular is there this is not practiced. So the take home messages is antibiotics are a precious group uh, do not in, uh, use antibiotics for viral infections uh, use antibiotics uh, only to treat prevent uh, bacterial infections according to the guideline uh, use the recommended doses and duration um, and uh, pre uh, practice the uh, infection control prevention measures to prevent infection that is uh, really important. Thank you. Stop misuse and save for future. Thank you.